All right. Well, we're talking uh, thematically out of uh, this idea of the seven, uh, sevenfold spirit of God or the seven spirits of God, as sometimes it's called. And um, <clears throat> I wanted to stay on that tonight, and tomorrow we're going to dig a little deeper. And so if you've got your Bibles, let's open them together to Isaiah, if I can get there myself. And uh, we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 11, where this is articulated. And Isaiah 11, 1 and following reads this way, There shall come forth a shoot from the stump of Jesse, and a branch from his roots shall bear fruit. And the spirit of the Lord shall be upon him, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, and his delight shall be in the fear of the Lord. Now it goes on and it, it says this, he shall not judge by what his eyes see or decide disputes by what his ears hear, but with righteousness he shall judge the poor and decide with equity, not to be mistaken for the current use of the term equity, as in diversity, equity, and inclusion, but he shall decide with equity for the meek of the earth, and he shall strike the earth with the rod of his mouth. This, by the way, is the uh, origin of the language that we see in Revelation of how he shall judge the nations with a rod of iron. So John is reflecting on his own knowledge of scripture and the words of Isaiah when he writes those words in Revelation. And with the breath of his lips he shall kill the wicked, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist and faithfulness the belt of his loins. All right, well, this is telling us about this one called the branch. The language of the branch also occurs in the prophetic literature of Zechariah. So when we start talking about um, these themes, there's a, there's a lot of interweaving that goes on. And, and what immediately becomes obvious if you're reading the scriptures well uh, and carefully is that the prophets of the later periods drew upon the prophets of the former periods, and so you're building this prophetic edifice and everything is interlinked. And I think that's often lost in our time because so much of the, uh, so much of the teaching that we have in the church today is very shallow from a scriptural point of view. But one of the things that we really have to do if we're going to be authentic to the ways of the Lord and the spirit of prophecy. I could say, and many other things too, but this is a school of the prophets, so I'll just leave it with that, uh, since presumably that's why most of us are here. Um, one of the things we have to do is we have to recover, recover the essential Hebrew roots of the scripture. And that's a gigantic statement, which could probably be its own sermon, and it won't be, tonight anyway, but, um, but true Christianity has a very strongly Hebraic feeling to it or, or sense or tone or, I don't know, you can use a different word if you want, but I think you understand what I'm, what I'm driving at. And one of the things that we have that's problematic with modern Christianity of the Western type, whether specific nations of Europe or the United States of America, is that we have really lost that rooting in Hebrew understanding of, well, everything. How do we define our terms? How do we define our practices? And so that's why when we got to that, just that one little thing about the rod of iron, I just mentioned that, well, John, he, you know, he's writing 2,700 years after Isaiah, but he's drawing on Isaiah, and he would have known the writings of Isaiah in fact, it was common practice for people in those days to memorize enormous chunks of the Bible, and they could just quote it. And they didn't sort of quote it. I mean, they quoted it verbatim because they understood that every jot and tittle was inspired. And uh, I think we need to recover that, and we need to stand on it and defend it because today the entire understanding of, of our faith is under siege. And part of what prophets do is they serve as reformers and they want, to, they want to call people back to fundamentals. So 
we read five verses of scripture here and we're going to unpack them tonight um, as, a, uh, as an effort to, to move back towards fundamentals. Well, in the New Testament, it says in 1 John 4, 17, as he is, so also are we in this world. This world, not in the age to come, this one right now. 1 John 4, 17. And so what that's telling us is that Jesus is the divine pattern. He's the divine pattern for everything. Um, he's the divine pattern for our lives. He's the divine pattern for how we live and minister. He's also the divine pattern of what it means to be a spirit-filled Christian. And, you know, Chris's new book, it, it presupposes that the sevenfold spirit of God is not just a theoretical reality or something that was achievable for Jesus. It presupposes that we too should be living in that dimension. Paul says in Romans, and I know it's one of Chris's favorite verses, 8.14, uh, Romans 8.14, all who are the sons of God, today to be inclusive, we'd probably say the children of God, uh, they are led by the Spirit of God. Or to say it exactly the way it says it, those who are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. So which Spirit of God is leading you? Well, there's this sevenfold dimension and it's, it's laid out here. But I wanna, I wanna try to drill into this idea that Jesus sets a divine pattern for us and with it he provides a template. He shows us, in fact, what it means, what it looks like to be a spirit-filled Christian and also he shows us a mechanism for getting there. It's one thing to say we ought to get there or we want to get there, but how do you get there? That's, that's the real uh, big question. So we don't have a lot of information about Jesus's early years. We have a little bit from the scripture, but notwithstanding that there isn't a lot there, we can still learn a lot from what is there. And I want to explore that in the context of these framing remarks about the Spirit of God who was upon Jesus. So here's something we know about Jesus. He was raised in a family where some aspects, some would say many aspects or a lot of aspects of the world of the Spirit was understood. His religion was not merely a moralistic religion. His religion was not simply a religion that was founded upon head knowledge and principles which you didn't implement. Jesus' entire upbringing, all that he was, all that he did was, was concentrated upon a particular kind of lived out experience and it formed and shaped him. Now with that we can draw a very important conclusion. It's so obvious it, it shouldn't need to be pointed out, but because it's so obvious, as with many things in life, what's obvious gets overlooked. So I'm going to make it obvious. God did not accidentally choose where Jesus would be born. He handpicked Joseph and Mary, and for very specific reasons. It had to do with the level of purity that they maintained in their own lives. I could unpack that whole statement as well, show you a lot of scriptures to back it up. But the bottom line is, Joseph and Mary set themselves up for selection. Now they couldn't pick themselves, only God could do that. But they did set themselves up to be selected. As by the way, did Zechariah and Elizabeth. It actually says in Luke 1, 6, that they were selected to be the parents of John the Baptist because they were scrupulous in their observance of God's ways. This is something that I think has largely passed from our modern vernacular and understanding of Christianity. Jesus said it this way, many are called but few are chosen. Okay, well, obviously Zechariah and Elizabeth and later, well, not much later, Joseph and Mary, they heard the call and they didn't just hear it you know, like a few days before each of them got pregnant, they heard the call probably years before, decades before, and they began upon a journey that led to their 
ultimately being fit vessels and then God had those whom he chose. Now there is this sovereign election dimension to what the Lord will lay his hand on people to do. So Jesus is growing up in a family where Gabriel visits Mary. This isn't just any old angel. According to the the collective scriptures, and by that I mean two of the archangels are mentioned in the Bible, and then there's two more mentioned, if you think that's right, the Catholics do. Um, The Protestants don't really comment on it. There's two more, but that's a total of four archangels, one of whom is Gabriel. He's the messenger angel. So it isn't just any old angel who rocks up to Mary and says, hey, Mary, guess what? This is Gabriel, the messenger angel, the one, by the way, who several hundred years before had appeared to Daniel and showed him the entire history of the world yet to come. That Gabriel. So this isn't, I mean, there's angelic visitations and then there's angelic visitations is what I'm saying. And Jesus is growing up in a home where his mother has what we now call the Annunciation. And Gabriel says to her, you know, you're going to bear this child. And Mary says, well, how can this be? I'm a virgin. And, And Gabriel says, well, the power of the Most High will overshadow you. And by the way, you will call his name Jesus for he will save his people from his sin. So he hasn't even been implanted in her womb yet, and already he's been named sovereignly by the word of the archangel Gabriel. And I really want to emphasize that. It's an archangel. It's not just an angel. A lot of us are like, I'd be happy to see any angel. But, but th- this, is a, this is a cut above. But it has to do with the preparation that's already been going on. You know, when John the Baptist came... One of his missions was to make sure that there was a people prepared. And I think what's going on in the earth right now is God is raising a John the Baptist generation. But what that means is John had to prepare himself to call people to be a people prepared. And if there's a John the Baptist generation being raised, then that means many people are being prepared. And that means that we have to become scrupulous about a lot of these sorts of issues. All right, so Gabriel visits Mary to announce Jesus' birth, and there's a miracle associated with the birth. We call it the virgin birth, because she says, I've never known a man. And you know, part of the, part of the scrupulousness of Joseph and Mary, and it's, it's, it's laid out uh, right in the pages of Scripture, is it says, once uh, Mary was pregnant, you know, Joseph de- intended to put her away, to divorce her. Now, they're, they're only engaged, but the understanding in the scripture, in the Hebrew culture, which is itself incarnational, people want to say, well, that's, that's Hebrew, that's not here. I would suggest that actually that should be the norm, that God allowed it to be happening in Hebrew culture instead of any other culture of the earth in order to show us how he thinks about it. And that's why it becomes inscripturated. So Joseph decides, look, she cheated on me, so I'm going to divorce her. And it's called divorce, even though they're only engaged, which is just an interesting factoid, given how common divorce is in our time. And an angel, but it's not Gabriel, it's just some random angel. (laughs) Of course, this is what you do. Mom hears from Gabriel, the archangel, and dad, he just gets an angel to come along, right? By the way, this whole story is in Matthew 1, 20 to 24, if you're taking notes. So uh, anyway, some random angel rocks up to Joseph, and he says, hey, don't be afraid to marry uh, this woman because what is conceived of her is from the Holy Spirit. And Joseph goes, okay, no problem. Well, that shows a kind of, I would say, pliability, yieldedness, submission to the ways of the Lord that oftentimes is not seen in our culture. Every man wants to do what is right in his own eyes, and every woman too. Are we all together? I'm talking about what it, mean, what it takes to be filled with the sevenfold spirit of God. That's where we're going with this. So there's a certain kind of disposition of heart and attitude that, that has to be formed within us so 
There's a confirming miracle, the virgin birth, but it's interesting, it says, now that Joseph has made up his mind, all right, I'm going to marry her anyway, um, the scripture makes this very, it's just a simple, like, it's not even a full clause, it's a phrase, but he says he had no union with her until after the birth of the child. Now, you might say TMI, but the point is, Joseph was determined not to lay a finger on this woman, even though she's his betrothed, even though she's going to be his wife, even though she's already pregnant. So, I mean, they're going to bear the reproach of her being pregnant and the baby coming a little bit, shall we say, out of time. For the rest of their lives, they're going to bear that, and yet he will not lay a finger on her. Not that way. I mean, he might have held her hand or put his arm around her, but he's not doing anything else. And that's part of that scrupulousness about the righteousness of the Lord. And it's just a simple little detail, but it's a really big detail because we all know how difficult that specific issue is to keep in check, especially in a licentious society like 2023 America, right? There was a rather half-hearted right. A few of you down here got it. The rest of you, I'm not so sure. Now, in addition to this, there's another confirming miracle that kind of brackets all this, and of course, it's the birth of John the Baptist. And it's interesting that if you look at this narrative, this story, narratives become kind of a dirty word in our time, but classically, when we use the word narrative, we just say, you know, what are, what are these accounts that are given to us in the pages of the Bible? So we've got one womb that's old and shriveled up and should not be bearing at all, and it comes to life, almost like a tree that's going to bear fruit or a shoot rising out of the branch of Jesse or stump of Jesse, right? So it's almost like Elizabeth's birth of John the Baptist is a prophetic sign of what's about to happen. And then it happens. So we've got the old desiccated dried up womb with a woman, we don't know how long uh, Zechariah and Elizabeth have been married, but they're old and it says, you know, it's no longer possible for them to have children naturally and yet she does and then we have Mary who's the virgin who's never been married and so clearly she shouldn't be having children but she is and so we have these pair of miracles they're both miraculous births but they're miraculous in different ways and so part of what's happening in a John the Baptist generation is there are some old things that are coming to life and awakening some of them have been lying dormant for many years or decades and others of them are much newer and fresher and they're, it's all converging into one story. All right, so we talked a little bit about Mary, we talked a little bit about Joseph, but there's more about Joseph because <clears throat> once Jesus is born, it says an angel came to him. It doesn't say which angel. Maybe it was the same as the first one, or maybe it was another one. But again, it's not Gabriel. It would have said if it were Gabriel. And he tells Joseph to flee to Egypt because Herod is going to seek to put the baby to death. And so he gets up that same night and goes. Now that's an interesting thing, which, because it shows uh, the heart of instantaneous obedience. Not just, okay, I'll get to it when I can. And so Joseph goes down to Egypt. Presumably that was a hardship. Um, you know, a lot of people have made commentary about how Jesus was a refugee and all that, and I think they're overplaying it. But on some level, there's some truth there. And if nothing else, it's quite likely that neither Joseph nor Mary, being peasants from Nazareth, uh, would have spoken Egyptian. So if nothing else, you've got the language barrier. And by the way, how are you going to earn a living down in Egypt? I mean, Joseph was a carpenter, so I guess he could maybe pick up some work somehow doing that. But it's tough to sell business when you don't speak Egyptian, right? I'm just trying to help you understand the context in which these things grow. And then after a while, an angel comes in a dream. So this is a third angelic visitation uh, telling him that the people who were trying to kill the baby are now dead and he can return. And then as he's returning, yet a fourth angel comes to him and says, don't, by the way, live in Judea. Don't live around Jerusalem. 
because there's a ruler named Archelaus and uh, Archelaus happens to be Herod's son <laughs> and uh, he'll try to put him to death too just to kind of carry out what his father had tried to accomplish and so there's four angelic visitations that Joseph can point to and you have to think about Jesus growing up in that household He's hearing about his mother talking about a visitation from the archangel Gabriel, and he's hearing his dad talk about four distinct visitations of angels. Yes, some of them are in dreams, but the Bible takes those as seriously as if he were wide awake and open-eyed. And so this is Jesus' milieu, it's his context. The other thing we know about his family is that they were observant. They weren't just casual Jews. And the scripture points out that they made an annual pilgrimage to the temple and Jesus went with them in one particular instance at age 12. Presumably he'd already been to the temple 11 times before this on the annual pilgrimage but nothing out of the ordinary happened on those first 11 trips. So this tells you that there is a certain kind of normativity of regular religious worship that was part of Jesus's life and he was raised into that. Let me suggest to you that you probably aren't going to raise very many prophets out of your children and grandchildren if they are not raised in the ways of the Lord. Again, it should go without saying, but we live in a time where so many people are afraid to be religiously observant for fear of being labeled religious. Well, okay, label me religious. But I'd rather, I'd rather be right in God's eyes than be cool and slick in the eyes of modernity. Is this making sense? And you know, it says of Jesus um, in his own ministry, based on what he was obviously discipled into, raised into, it says of Jesus that when he, uh, when he went to at least a couple of the synagogues, it says he went there on a Sabbath day as was his custom which means it was usual and customary for him to be in synagogue. Our equivalent would be to be in church. And similarly, Paul the Apostle, as was his custom. So part of how we generate that, that, um, that context for our own prophetic growth and maturation and becoming filled with the sevenfold spirit of God. We haven't even gotten there yet. I'm just laying the runway to get the B-52 in the air. You know, it takes 15,000 feet of runway, three miles to get a fully loaded B-52 in the air. So we're just, we're just on the runway and we're rolling, but we aren't even airborne yet. All right, so at age 12, he goes to this Passover celebration in Jerusalem. Like I said, he's been there 11 times before. This story is found in Luke 2, 41 to 52. Every one of these could be a sermon, but I only have one shot at this tonight, and you know, I've already burned up 16 minutes. So, But anyway, at age 12, this would have been roughly the time of his own bar mitzvah, and it turns out he's talking with the teachers in the temple, and he's apparently seeking understanding of the scriptures. Now, he's been raised in the scriptures. He's been raised attending a local synagogue up in the north of Israel, and presumably they had, well, good enough teachers. I mean, the, the, the experts are in Jerusalem, but he's no slouch. But the thing that's interesting is Jesus is such an earnest kid. He's so focused on the things of the scriptures. Note that he's not talking about angels or his mother's visitation from Gabriel. That's just part of his background. That's just given. But what he's really after is the scriptures. And as he's doing that, they're amazed at him because he shows so much understanding and profound understanding. And what this tells you is Jesus didn't just get all of that by going to synagogue every week, as was his custom, it was coming because in his household, his mother and father were talking about it all the time. It was part of how they framed their conversation. The word is not to be far from you. It is to be in your mind and in your mouth. This is what the Lord's angel told Joshua. 
and this is how you will have good success. So Jesus is clarifying some things, but he's already, we would say by modern standards, more than fluent in the scripture. I'm just letting that sink in. Hi out there in TV land. This goes for everybody, right? So he's obviously building on what he's learned in his upbringing but here's another thing we can say about Jesus and this is all the context for being filled with the spirit of God the sevenfold spirit of God after returning to Nazareth it says Luke 2 51 and 52 he submitted to his parents now he, he, he obviously has an emerging understanding of his own calling and destiny I'm sure Mary has told him some but not all of the things that happened around the time of his birth. Maybe he has some early memories of fleeing down to Egypt. So I could imagine a very young Jesus, Papa, why did we go to Egypt? <laughs> right? Because, because they were there, and he would have remembered that, you know, with his childhood memory. <clears throat> so he has these things that he's talking about with them, and they probably didn't tell him everything. It says that some of what the angel told Mary, she treasured in her heart which means she didn't talk about it. Maybe not even with Jesus. She just watched and waited. But there would have been other things she would have told him. And um, so he's submitting to his parents as he's having a growing understanding of his own role in the world, of this immense calling that he has placed on him. And the scripture makes this interesting comment, Luke 2.52, and Jesus grew in wisdom and in stature, which is to say... His wisdom grew as his body grew. As he started to hit puberty, as he grew into maturity, as he's a younger man, his wisdom continues to increase. And as this is going on, he has favor with God and with man. So people can identify that the hand of the Lord is on this kid. There's something unusual about him. But again, this did not just happen randomly. It came out of an entire context of his parents and their spirituality. It came out of a home where the scriptures were reverenced and honored. It came out of a home where religious observance was going on. Not maybe, we don't like the word legalism, but there was a Jewish law. We'll just say scrupulously rather than legalistically, but attentively. They were very attuned to this, so much so that every year they took time off to go to Jerusalem. This is all what's going on with him, and all of that is what allows him to grow in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and man. You could short-circuit this at any point. Many are called, but few are chosen. Does this make sense? And during his youth, during his young adulthood... And then later in his earthly ministry, we have another very interesting and very important data point, which I'm going to take you to now. It's found in the book of Hebrews. <clears throat> in Hebrews chapter 7, it says, In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to him who is able to save him from death. Now many commentators think that this is referring specifically to Gethsemane. And it might well refer to Gethsemane, but I think it's much bigger than that. Because it says in the days of his flesh, which sounds a little more all-encompassing than in the hours preceding his death. That would be more localized and focused. And it says he was heard because of his reverence. So what that suggests to me is that there were times in Jesus' life as he's growing up and maybe even beyond age 18. He doesn't really emerge until about age 30. And so he's got, you know, 12 years beyond age 18. And by the way, 18 is our number. Under Jewish law, you were a fully-fledged adult once you had bar mitzvah. So maybe it's more like up to age 12, he's a boy, and then from 12 to 30, he's got 18 years of this. But whatever is going on here... He is offering up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears. Now, this tells us something about the kind of prayer life we need to have. 
and I'm sure there were times when Jesus was reverent and his head was bowed and he, you know, oh, Father, I, you know, I bless you. Blessed art thou, O Lord, our God, King of the universe, who bringeth forth food from the earth and so forth. But loud cries and tears can only be understood one way. Father! And I guess he probably went out into the hills to do that. Probably wasn't doing that one in town. And at times he was so moved by whatever the subject about which he was praying may have been that it moved him to tears. Maybe it was the plight of the people around him who were struggling, who were sick, who were oppressed by the Romans. Maybe at other times it had to do with insights that he wanted into scripture, but he was emotionally engaged with this. It wasn't merely play acting. And the thing that moved heaven to answer his prayers was his reverence was his reverence which means he had a sense of the holy and he wouldn't do anything to violate the holiness of God his father and then the passage goes on and it says although he was a son he learned obedience through what he suffered which is to say as much as he loved him the father allowed Jesus to go through trials, temptations, tribulations. At a minimum, I'll tell you one thing he went through. He went through what today we would call bullying. Guaranteed, he went through this. Why? Because everybody knew that his mother had gotten pregnant before the wedding. And not only did everybody know that, there was this strange story about an angel appearing and everyone was like, <laughs> yeah, right. So I suppose one of his nickname in, in his childhood when the neighborhood kids were bullying him would have been Angel Boy. Why? Well, because an angel said that, you know, my mom was going to have me. And, uh, you know, let's just say that I know the world has changed a bit. But when I was a boy, if you called a boy angel... Chris is over there laughing at the term angel boy. And of course, his father had the four visitations from angels. So, you know, as kids might do, he, he might have said, well, I'm here because, you know, the angel said, and they're all like, ah, yeah, oh yeah, angel boy over here. And so he would have gotten hazed. He would have had a, a measure of that going on. And again, I'm just trying to put a face on this. We read these scriptures and they're one dimensional. I'm trying to help you understand the process that God will let you go through as you come under this thing so the sevenfold spirit of God can land on you. And so being mocked, being ridiculed is not always bad. It's not easy, it's not fun, but it says he learned obedience through what he suffered. It's interesting, we have no incidents of Jesus not being obedient, but there was something about this that caused him to maintain obedience rather than veering off the path. And so obedience, based in reverence, is an essential component of becoming a fit receptacle for the sevenfold spirit of God. All good? All right. Well, around age 30, Jesus goes for baptism. And we have <clears throat> a couple of key parts of what go on at his baptism. In Luke 3.21, there's a description of Jesus being baptized. And it says, while he was praying, so he's standing in the Jordan River, and he's praying having been dunked, so he's wet, and it says, the heavens opened and the Spirit of God descended on him in bodily form like a dove. This might be somehow analogous. It's like a word picture or a, a cipher of when people are converted because baptism, of course, is the, is the initiatory sacrament that we have when people are born again. But this isn't all of the Holy Spirit that he could have. This is the beginning. Now, there's a lot of theology around the whole concept of Jesus and the Spirit and, 
you know, was he devoid of the Spirit? Well, no, because the Trinity is triune, but Jesus was incarnate. So there's been a lot of ink and blood spilled over this conversation. I'll simply say this. It seems that the Spirit of God was somehow with Jesus, but now he comes upon Jesus in the, in the waters of baptism. And that's Luke 3.21, when the dove lands on him. Now just think about it for a second. When you're in the river and you're praying and the dove lands on you, there's only a limited amount of real estate that the dove can use to land. This is one option. This is another option. Anywhere along the arms and, of course, in the hands. And that's it because you're in the water and you're upright. So there's nowhere else this dove can land on him. It doesn't say where it lands, it just does. But now Jesus leaves the river. And you know, the spot, the spot where Jesus was baptized in the Jordan River is not very wide. It's uh, maybe roughly from that ramp there uh, over to here where the, where the boom is. It's about that wide right at that point. So if Jesus is roughly at the midpoint, kind of where I am, he's sort of, you know, 15 paces to get out of the river. And it says in Luke 4, 1, that as he's coming out of the river, he is filled with the Spirit. He gets an upgrade in the infilling of this Spirit of God, this sevenfold Spirit of God. But note with interest that it took until his 30th year for that to happen. 30 years. 30 years. Now, I'm not saying everybody's going to wait 30 years, but I am, I am trying to draw out the fact that it may not be instantaneous and notwithstanding that we shouldn't give up because sometimes people do and you'll hear people say well I've prayed and prayed and God hasn't answered my prayer I'm done I'm giving up wrong answer so then he goes into the wilderness and he's tempted by the devil for 40 days and Note this, although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. Was the wilderness part of his suffering? Unquestionably. I mean, I talked about being hazed and bullied, but the wilderness is unquestionably part of it because it's actually noted in Scripture. And it says he was with the wild animals. Kind of an interesting note. Um, <laughs> Was he scared? Were they bringing him? I mean, I don't know what they were doing. But anyway, he's got wild animals around him. And for a lot of us, we'd go, ah, wild animals. I don't want wild animals around me. So anyway, after 40 days, he comes out. And now Luke 4, 18, he's in the power of the spirit. So he has this thing of the dove landing on him. He gets the upgrade essentially in the same hour immediate context as he comes out of the river he's standing on the river bank he's drying off and then 40 days later he gets yet another upgrade when the power of the spirit is on him and now he begins to move uh, in the signs and wonders that characterize his ministry it's interesting that at this point I think the sevenfold spirit of God is fully invested upon Jesus and it says in the book of Revelation if I can get my pages not to stick together but I refuse to preach from a digital Bible Jesus says of himself in Revelation 3 1 to the angel of the church in Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars so this seems to be kind of the the conclusion not that it ever really ends, but it's the conclusion of all that preparatory and initiatory uh, activity. Now let's go back to Isaiah, now that we've laid the runway. Isaiah had prophesied about this shoot that would come forth from the stump of Jesse. What's Isaiah talking about? Well, this is a biblically literate crowd, or literate enough. Jesse, of course, is the father of David. And so it's speaking of a shoot that's going to grow out of that family tree that is Jesse's family tree. And a shoot is what? It's new growth that's springing up from what seems to be a stump that was cut off. And he says, and the branch from his roots would bear fruit. So this is speaking of the line of the kings. And what had been dissipated and seemed cut off or dead would come to life. I want to suggest to you that in this hour, we're going to see a lot of things that seem to have been cut off, that had been dead ends. They are coming to life. 
and part of the sevenfold spirit of God upon the people of God is there is a resurrection life. One of the commands that Jesus gave his disciples was heal the sick and raise the dead. Well, it does literally mean raising the dead, but I think there's a wider context beyond dead bodies. How about dead, dream, dead dreams, dead prophecies, and more? And, and just right now in this hour, the one in which we're living today, March the 14th, 2023, to remove all ambiguity about what I mean, we crossed a line of demarcation in this nation in February. And when we started March, we were on in a new state of nature, as though we had crossed out of the Jordan River ourselves, and we as a people, we as the people of God, and everyone I'm talking to, everywhere I'm going, everyone I'm communicating with, is aware that things have changed. It's easy to get people saved, healing is easy, deliverance is easy, uh, prophecies are up, dreams are up, but really what's happening in this context is most of you, as I look at your average age in the crowd, have been waiting a generation for a word that Paul Kane delivered starting in 1988 called Joel's Army. And I'm not sure I fully agreed with Paul's handling of the book of Joel, but I did agree with his idea. I just thought it was an interesting way of reading Joel. But the idea that there would be a, you know, a group of people, we, today we use the term an army of people, army has a lot of connotations, so we'll just say a group of people, who would have the Spirit of God upon them and would you know, go forth for the Lord. I think when Paul preached that in 1988, everybody thought it would happen by 1989 but it didn't happen. By the way, at the same time, Bob Jones started talking about a billion soul harvest, which would precede a three billion soul harvest. And the billion soul harvest would be the fish cleaners who would, well, clean the three billion souls that would come in later. Well, that was one thing to say in 1988, which was 35 years ago, or a generation. That was one thing. Um, but did you know that in November of 2022, so six months ago, the population of the earth passed 8 billion people? So when we talk about it, uh, all up, 4 billion souls being, being gathered in, we are talking about harvesting half the earth. Half the earth. And many of you have grown old waiting for this to occur. Well, around the time Bob was talking about this billion soul harvest, he gave us some things to watch for that would be indicia of when it would happen. One of those was he said there would be a pill that would be used for abortion. Well, at the time, that wasn't, that wasn't a thing. It was unknown, and many people who knew Bob and believed in his ministry did not believe that prophecy but now that pill is widely available. And notwithstanding the Roe v. Wade thing, drug companies are mailing these pills to people all over the country, even in states that have passed laws restricting abortion. And uh, they're delivered by U.S. mail, which means they're kind of exempt from the laws that the states may pass, which means a lot of women have just shifted the mechanism by which they go through abortion. Bob's word came to pass. Bang, there's sign one. Another thing he said was that homosexuals would uh, be legitimized and they would be demonstrating in the streets of the world and it would, be it would be done with the full blessing of the governments of the earth. Well, at the time in the 1980s, that wasn't possible because the sentiments of, of the earth were not such and largely it was because of the influence of Judeo-Christian thinking and the influence of scriptures. But in the last 35 years, we've effectively lost our knowledge of scripture and even if we have knowledge of it, people tend to disregard it. And as a result, that has come to pass. So there was another marker. And then Bob said that um, there would be a new win of the Super Bowl by the Kansas City Chiefs. That one probably doesn't need unpacking. But I will say I remember Bob talking about two wins. He said that he didn't say they'd be next to each other, i.e. Uh, sequential, but he did say that they would be close together. So in 2020, there was a win, and that, that ended the 50-year drought on the Super Bowl. But that really meant that you know God's chiefs were now on deck. 2023 comes, they win again, and it's on. And that was about the same time as Asbury kicked off. 
And at the end of Asbury, bracketing that, we get the Jesus Revolution movie, which has really awakened people to those times again. And there's more I could say, uh, including Lou Engel's communion revival. But, but the bottom line is, when we look at all that collectively happening in the month of February, we crossed a line of demarcation. So what had dissipated and seemed cut off would come to life. I think that, I think that absolutely has historic meaning with Jesus emerging because the line of the kings had seemingly been severed. I mean, even quote-unquote King Herod, he was an Edomite. He was a pretender to the throne. He, he should have never been the king of Israel, but he had usurped it. And this is why he wanted to kill Jesus when he heard the wise men say, where is he who has been born the king of the Jews? He realized that his pretender status was now in question. And the only way to stop that is to get rid of this baby before he could grow old enough to supplant him. So what had been dissipated and seemed cut off would come to life. And this wouldn't merely be growth, but it would be fruit-bearing growth. And this shoot, this branch, would have the Spirit of the Lord upon him. This is a return of the kingly anointing. It comes from Jesse's line, not Aaron's. That line is, the Aaron's line, that side of it's described in Luke. But in Matthew, we're looking at the kingly line. And this is what it says. This is the spirit of wisdom. The Hebrew word is shokma or chokma. And it means skill or prudence or administration and it also can mean war fighting, but what it really means is somebody who is a strategic thinker. Somebody who understands time seasons and what to do at the right time. Some call it the Issachar anointing. I don't care what language you put around it as long as we're clear about what we mean. All right, then he says it's the spirit of understanding. The Hebrew word is binya, and it means knowledge and discernment. So it's both natural learning, but it's also knowing what to do with it. And it also means being able to cut through the fog, which Jesus frequently did in his interactions with the Pharisees. It's also the spirit of counsel. The Hebrew word is etzah, and it means, well, counsel or advice or purpose. <coughs> it can also mean uh, cleverness and the ability to predict. And so maybe a good summary word for etza would be discernment. And we'll talk more about this one tomorrow. It's also the spirit of might. The Hebrew word is geburah. And it means strength or valor or bravery or power. It means the mighty acts of God. But might in general, and we might summarize that one as the power to effectuate. Yes, that is actually a verb the power to effectuate, to make things happen. Not just to talk about them, but there's a kinesis to it. There's something catalytic that happens in it. And it's also the spirit of the knowledge of the Lord, the da'at of the Lord. So with it, it's not just knowing God and knowing his ways, but with it comes a kind of, this word often has a negative connotation in English, but the best word for it is cunning. People who are you're not going to get the drop on them very easily. So all of this is embedded in the sevenfold spirit of God. This is what's resting upon the Lord. And the last one is, this is the spirit of the fear of the Lord. The Hebrew word is yerah. And it means the fear or the terror, the holy fear, the reverence of God. Well, we saw that in Hebrews. He was heard because of his reverence. He was cultivating a place in his life that would, that would be, it's like a ball and socket joint. It would be the perfect landing place for that spirit of God that looks like this because he had already created a receptacle that looked like reverence. Does that make sense? So what am I, what am I doing? I'm, I'm digging a deep well here but I'm trying to show you the kind of life that we want to be cultivating ourselves and in our families in order that these things can land upon us so that we are receptacles. Now, as we think about this, there is a comparison that we can make to the Jesus we've just described to the natural state of humans. So I'll, first I'll describe Jesus as characterized and the spirit that he's carrying 
and then I'll suggest to you this is what normal humanity looks like and you will see the very sharp contrast. So he has the spirit of God upon him, the spirit of the Lord. And we've already said at this moment we're specifically going after the kingly anointing as opposed to the priestly anointing. All right, that's what Jesus is carrying. But we in our fallen humanity have a fallen subservience and we are captive to Satan. We literally serve him and can't get out from underneath that captivity unless we are rescued. Does that describe the fallen state of humanity? Oh, yeah. And even having been saved, do we sometimes need to be broken free of that which still binds us or is left over? Oh, yeah. That's why we have the deliverance ministry. All right, then there's the spirit of wisdom. Well, in our natural state, we are unwise, we are foolish. And then there's the spirit of understanding. In our natural state, in contrast to that, what are we? Imprudent, undiscerning, naive, foolish, words like that. He has the spirit of counsel upon him. Well, when someone has a spirit of counsel, people seek them out because they know they're going to get good, sound advice. Well, many people are not worthy of being consulted because they are fools, as the scripture says. And uh, so <laughs> we want to move away from fool and move towards being somebody who is discerning and wise. That, that requires both a conscious choice and an intentionality, but it also means cultivating the life of the mind, learning to weigh and judge things well, and to what we might call common sense, although these days it's not always common. The spirit of might, well, we're going to talk about that one more tomorrow, but uh, many of us in our natural state, we are weak with appetites that drive and control us or passions that dominate us. There is no divine power in our lives. And then the spirit of knowledge, <clears throat> many of us are ignorant, we're untaught in our natural state. And then the fear of God, well, the very nature of the age in which we live is a spirit of irreverence. And so you can see the very stark contrast between this man, Jesus, and who we are in our natural state, and you can understand why we have to cultivate a place that's a resting place, a landing place, so that the Spirit of God will come down. I think that's why the dove would come down in the river. I mean, he was sinless, and I'm not taking away from that. I'm just saying beyond sinless, there's a whole attitude of heart and lifestyle that goes with it. Now, obviously, an anointing by the Spirit in this manner is to be highly prized, but can what he had be ours also? And if so, how do we come into it? Well, yes is the answer, and now we're going to show you how. Are we all good? I'm running a little long. Is that okay? Are we out there? okay out there in TV land too? All right. So... When Jesus was a boy in the temple at age 12, he's sitting with the teachers and he's asking questions about the scripture. We've already covered that and laid that down as part of his process. In Jesus' time, the scriptures were divided into three parts, the law, the prophets, and the writings. In Hebrew, Torah, Nevi'im, and Ketuvim. Now, we all know about the Torah, right? That's, that's the five books of Moses. And, of course, the books of the prophets run from, um, well, Joshua sometimes gets tagged into the Torah and sometimes not, depends on which, which Hebrew scholar you're following. But certainly by the time of the judges, all the way up through the end of the Chronicles, uh, we're talking about the books of the prophets, the Nevi'im. But the Ketuvim are these collection of writings that are often called the wisdom writings. We've got the Psalms, we've got the, um, we've got the Proverbs, uh, we've got Ecclesiastes and so forth. So the third group of these writings, one of the books in there is the book of Proverbs. And I want to suggest to you that if you're going to cultivate this life that will be a landing place for the Spirit, the book of Proverbs should be a book that you are reading all the time. In fact, it says in the book of Proverbs that wisdom cries out and seeks to be found. It actually wants to be discovered by the, the foolish and the ignorant, is, is what it says, um, by the sons and daughters of men. And there's actually, believe it or not, there is a, there is a template laid out in Proverbs chapter 2, which is where we're going right now, that shows what this looks like because it is really the unlocking 
of this thing that we read initially out of Isaiah 11, 1 to 5. And I'll try to show you the, the tiebacks. So you might want to put one finger in Proverbs and one finger in Isaiah. But I would also recommend that you study this after the fact because um, there's a lot here. And obviously, if you meditate on the scriptures, they will get into you and you'll grow in them. So in the book of Proverbs, <clears throat> we have a series of if-then propositions. If you do this, then this will happen. And so these if-then propositions give us real understanding of certain things that could be ours if we will go after them. Now, this is really important if you're, if you're at all interested in the sevenfold spirit of God because if you will take this to heart, you can cultivate a resting place for that spirit. If you don't, you won't. It's that simple. So it's your choice, but here's the operator's manual. So Proverbs 2, 1 to 4, my son, could be my daughter, if you receive my words and treasure up my commandments with you, making your ear attentive to wisdom and inclining your heart to understanding, yes, if you call out for insight and raise your voice for understanding, if you seek it like silver and search for it uh, as for hidden treasures, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. So what are the internal attitudes that are described here? Number one, receive the words of the Lord. Now in this case, the words of the Lord are coming through the lips of Solomon, which means among other things, presuming that your leaders are good, godly people. I think Chris and Rick passed the test. Not all pastors today would, but you're in a good place here. If you will pay attention to the words of the Lord, not just what's in the book, but from those who are set over you. And in the, in the New Testament, it says that we should submit to our leaders. It actually does say that. And many people don't. So receiving the words of the Lord is absolutely about the Bible, but it's also about, uh, I would say, non-maniacal, non-manipulative, non-cultic leadership submission. So there, anybody who was going to get triggered, now you don't need to be triggered because I put in all the safe words and you can back away from being triggered. All right, the second thing you have to do is you have to make your ear attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understanding. What does this mean? That you treasure the words you get. Now, what does it mean to treasure? Well, Mary treasured up in her heart the words that Gabriel had given her. So this means you roll them over again and again, and you think about different angles of it. You think about how does this apply to this in my life? How does this apply to this in my life? And how do I manage that and deal with that in the right way? And then he says, uh, inclining your ear to understanding. So you're making your ears attentive to wisdom. You're listening carefully, we could say, with the objective of getting more. You don't just assume, okay, God, thanks for the download. Got that. We're good. It's actually, now that you gave me that, let me be faithful in little that you may give me more. Because when we talk about the Spirit of God, there should be an unending flow of revelation. And then incline is a word that's used here. Uh, we're going to incline our heart or lean in and submit our will to all that God has. Now, I could say so much about this business of submitting the will, but I will simply leave it here for tonight and say that there are many people today who claim that they are on fire for God, but when it draws a line across whatever their preferred behavior is, and I've got, a, I've got a particular list of items that are on my short list that I really like to go after um, because I see this violated so routinely and people always say, well, I'm under grace, I can do what I want. No, you can't. Paul makes it clear. Shall I sin that grace may, be, may abound? May it never be. Actually, the Greek is meganoido, and when I learned Greek, I learned it from the lead translator of the, of the RSV Bible which back in the day was actually a really solid translation. The new one to this that's out these days, I would not go near that one. They've played with it. But the original RSV was actually one of the best translations that's ever come out and solidly rooted in the King James. And so I studied Greek with the lead translator of the RSV uh, version back in the last millennium. <laughs> Call me Methuselah. So, um, 
Anyway, his, his read on that was, may it never be. The Greek under that is meganoido, and he said, it's not really fit for consumption in churches, but the best way to render that into modern English would be hell no. So this lawlessness of our age is actually one of the biggest distractors from letting the sevenfold spirit of God land and rest upon us. And if you have that in your heart, you need to turn from it or you will be stymied literally for the rest of your Christian life. And you will never be led by the spirit of God and therefore you will never truly be a son or daughter of God. I'm not saying you won't be saved. I'll just say that your life will be frustrating and, and ineffective, ineffective and fruitless. That will happen. All right, so that's all the internal posture of the heart, but then here's the external behaviors, starting in verse three. Yes, if you call out for insight, raise your voice for understanding. So call out for insight, ask for it. And call out doesn't mean, oh God, I pray you'd make me more insightful. It means you gotta find some place. I don't know where that some place is, but there's some woods in South Carolina if you need to go down to the beach and get up at 4 a.m. when no one else is on the beach, but call out for insight. I remember in the years of the Australian revival when I was spending about six months a year in Australia, you know, it's an island nation and you can find beaches there still, unlike in America, that are totally and completely undeveloped. Miles of them. And I would get up in the mornings, many mornings, and I would go down to the beach, and I, I could see somebody coming way, like way down the beach, if anyone was coming at all. But a lot of it was just empty beach. And I would go out, and I would literally scream, calling out, asking God to send that kind of insight, that understanding, to, to reverence his spirit, to know his ways. I would do that for long hours until I got hoarse. And then I'd think, oh, that wasn't your best move because you got to preach tonight. But anyway, call out for insight and note that it said, and raise your voice for understanding. Where do you think Jesus got the idea of raising his voice with loud cries and supplications that we looked at in Hebrews 5? I intentionally set you up by taking you to Hebrews 5 to show you that what Jesus was doing was he was running the tracks of Proverbs 2 to become the man who could carry the sevenfold spirit of God. I first showed you that it was him, and now I'm showing you where he got it. He got it out of the Ketuvim. Now this is, this is defining a spirituality for you. It's defining a spiritual practice. It's defining a way of life that may be lost in America, but we're going to recover it as a people if we're going to be that John the Baptist people. And then he says, seek it out like silver or hidden treasure. Maybe we could say a lottery ticket. But the point is money is always a motivator. It always has been. It certainly was in the days of Solomon. It was in the days of Jesus, and it is in our time. And most people are highly motivated by profit. I'm not saying that's always bad. It can get to be too much and become greed. But the point is, the scripture enjoins upon us that we would seek out this kind of understanding as though it were silver or gold or precious stones. Now, those are seven preconditions four of them are internal heart attitudes receive the words of the lord treasure the commandments make your ears attentive to wisdom and incline your heart to understand and submit your will those are the four internal heart postures and then there's three external behaviors actions that you do with your body one of them is to call out for insight two is to raise your voice to shout aloud for that understanding wherever you have to go to do that and number three is to seek it out as though it were something worth having like gold or silver or the latest buy recommendation on Bitcoin or whatever stock you happen to like. And of course, for a lot of us, our hearts have become diluted. Jesus talks about how the worries of the life, the cares of this world, and the deceitfulness of riches can choke out the word and make it unfruitful. So while money is good, wisdom is better. While money is good, the sevenfold spirit of God is better. This passage continues on. 
and it describes if you will meet these seven brief qualifications, don't even get started without moving yourself over to there, but if you will meet these seven pre-qualifications, here is what will happen. This is, the, this is the then part. And watch as we go through this how many of these compare to the etzah and the geburah, the counsel and the might of the sevenfold spirit of God, which is really what I've been assigned to talk about this weekend. So tomorrow morning I have two sessions and one will talk about counsel and one we're going to talk about power or might. But right now I'm just giving you a, a kind of a grand overview. Here's what's going to happen if you do all of that. <clears throat> Proverbs 2, 5 to 15. If you'll do everything in 1 through 4, then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find the knowledge of God. Well, wow, there is a promise to hang on to. I can actually have understanding of the fear of the Lord and I will know God. I could be like Abraham or Enoch or Isaiah or Jesus. Wow, how about that? Does that motivate you? Now, you could say that in a lot of churches and they'd be like, uh, are we done yet? <laughs> I want to go get some coffee. But you guys are morning star. And you're in the school of the prophets, so you're like, you're the real hoo -yah. All right. For the Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the, hill, uh, the ways of his saints. Now watch this, then. There's a then statement. So the seven preconditions, here's what's going to happen now. Verse 9, then you will understand righteousness and justice and equity and every good path. For wisdom will come into your heart and knowledge will be pleasant to your soul. Discretion will watch over you. Understanding will guard you, delivering you from the way of evil, from men of perverted speech who forsake the paths of, up, um, of uprightness to walk in the ways of darkness, who rejoice in doing evil and delight in the perverseness of evil. I've got like five politicians right in front of my face as I read verse 14. Men whose paths are crooked and who are devious in their ways. And six more just popped up. <clears throat> all right, so these are all the then statements. Now we covered you will get the fear of the Lord. You know that fear of the Lord, the word here is yirah, but it tracks identically to Isaiah 11.2. So this then statement is saying you will catch that piece of the sevenfold spirit of God that is defined and delineated in Isaiah 11:2 simply by doing this. That is that's like one of that promise is as big as this entire atrium. It's a huge promise and it's ironclad because it's in the word of God. People always say how do I get there? I'm telling you how to get there. I'm not saying it's easy, but once you understand it at least you can start doing it right all right so you will understand the fear of the lord you will also find the knowledge of god that's in 2 5 the word there is da'at it's the exact word that's found in isaiah 11 2 not kind of the same word the identical word why do you think jesus was asking the men in the temple the teachers and the scribes about the ketuvim specifically the book of Proverbs, specifically the second chapter of the book of Proverbs, because he knew his identity, he knew his destiny, and he was trying to figure out, how do I activate that? How do I live into that? How do I keep growing in wisdom and stature and in favor with God and men? And they were showing him, they were like, where does this kid understand the Bible this well? This is some of the most closely guarded secrets of the rabbinate, and here he is, 12 years old, and he understands this. If a 12-year-old can get this, you can too. That should be a point of excitement and hope and hallelujah. All right, here's another one. Verse 6 of this passage, the Lord will give chokma wisdom, chokma is the other way to say it, and da'at, knowledge and understanding, and with it you will receive tabun, which is the same language as taburach, which is the spirit of might. It's literally the ability to activate the dynamic power of God. By the way, I'll just pause here. This is not in my text, but I, it just seems like an appropriate place to do it. Um, in October, I'm, 
I have a conference happening in Nashville. We haven't opened registration yet, but a lot of you would want to be there, both because it's reasonably close, but because Chris is going to be one of the speakers um, on opening night. And uh, it's on, um, it's called Fusion, when prophecy and the miraculous merge. Because there is a place in God where those two become one synchronous thing. And we're going to explore all of that. Um, so just FYI, watch for it in our social media and all the usual places. And uh, registration will open pretty soon. It'll be October 18 to 21. I'm mentioning this because we're talking about wisdom. We're talking about the Spirit of God and that dimension of the Spirit of God. And we're talking about something that's highly prophetic, but right in the midst of it is a power expression that is merged right into that revelatory component. So they're not supposed to be two different things. It's one continuum. Does that make sense? It's just more of a question of which, which side of it is, is most on exhibit. So that piece was found in chapter 2, verse 6 of Proverbs. Again, it tracks back to Isaiah 11, 2. And out of these things that are stored up for the upright, that's in 2, 7, um, comes protection and justice. Would you like God to protect you? Would you like him to look out for you? Would you like to vindicate? Would you like to have him vindicate you before your enemies who are tracking you down? Here's the promise that, that is with it. And so Isaiah 11.4 talks about that dimension of it, and it's tracking to chapter 2, verse 8. And it all comes to those who walk in integrity, uprightness, perfection, and simplicity. Not only that, chapter 2, verse 9, again in Proverbs, we will understand the, the word is bin, and we talked about binya when we were looking at it over in Isaiah. So same root word. So this is discernment the ability to observe with understanding. It's not simply to see something, but to understand the significance of it. Oh, that one's a sign, whereas that's just a natural phenomenon with no revelatory content. And it's also the ability to articulate that, to teach it, to tell it to others. All of that is wrapped up in the word being, and it's in 2.9 here in Proverbs, but it tracks back to Isaiah 11.4. And so we will understand righteousness, by the way, the word for righteousness there is sedek. And let me just say this. This is a word we need to recover in our time because sedek not only means righteous, it means what is just and what is normal or normative. Now, in an age where all the boundaries are being moved on everything, we need some sedek to say, here's the plumb line. This is what it is. And a lot of times, you know, as I travel, Christians will ask me questions that I'm not sure Christians should be asking these things. I mean, I'd rather that they ask than be confused. But I think, why are you confused? The, the scripture is quite clear about this. But you see, we live in a time where many are tossing to and fro in the waves of the sea because of the times in which we live. And so the scripture goes on and it says, we will also understand justice or mishpat. This is in verse 9 of this Proverbs chapter. Chapter 2, verse 9, we will understand justice. That one tracks right back identically to Isaiah 11:4. What's Jesus doing? He knows his own calling and destiny. He knows he's this special character. He may even know exactly what that means at this young age, but he's trying to activate that by using Proverbs as the template to activate Isaiah 11. Does that make sense? All right, so... When we talk about justice, mishpat is the word, and it means to reach a proper legal decision, to determine, to determine what is proper or fitting. Now, sometimes we use the word equity, but really we could just say what's fair, what is just, what's the way this should fall in a dispute so that, so that righteousness prevails and we get a proper adjudication of whatever this conflict is. Do our courts need some of this? Do our schools need some of this? Do our police departments need some of this? Do our corporations need some of this? Well, a lot of us are not called to be preachers. We're sent into the world to carry this spirit of God into the world, and that's prophetic. 
Just the mere fact of holding up a right standard of justice, not this false justice thing that we've watched play out in the news for the last three years, but a true standard biblical justice, that's, that's a big part of what a lot of you are called to do in your natural days when you're not sitting in this room getting teaching. We will also, stand, uh, also understand equity. So 2.9 in Proverbs tracks to Isaiah 11.4. The Hebrew word is meshar, and it means freedom from bias, judging with right judgment. I love that, freedom from bias. I don't take sides needlessly. I just go on what is the right and proper thing. The Bible promises us that we can see with that clear of an eye that, as it says, um, you know, when, when Samuel missed it with all of David's brothers, and the Lord says, the Lord does not look on outward appearance, God looks on the heart. And Paul says, stop judging by mere appearances. Henceforth we regard no man after the manner of the flesh. The ability to carry that out and to have that level of discernment and wisdom arises out of this. But it is a dimension of the sevenfold spirit of God. All right, we will receive wisdom, again, chokmah or chokmah in our hearts. It's in this chapter in 2.10, and it tracks back to Isaiah 11.2. Again, if we had way more time, I could show you, you know, back and forth, back and forth, but I'm already over time, and I'm just trying to get this out there. So some of you are taking notes. You can have an awesome Bible study with the Lord later. All right, um, we will receive knowledge, da'at, to please our souls. What are our souls? Our minds and our emotions and our will. So this is found in 2.10 of Proverbs. It tracks back to Isaiah 11.2. We will receive the da'at of the Lord in order that we may live under shalom and find fatness in all that God wants to give us. What does this mean? It implies blessing will follow righteousness. Wow. I'd like to live in righteousness if for no other reason. There are many better reasons. But if I had no other reason, purely because I will be rewarded for it in this lifetime. How about that one? All right, then number 10, we have discretion. The Hebrew word is mezima. It means the good plan will guard us. And the Hebrew word to guard is natsar. It will watch over us. And this is reminiscent of Psalm 91. God will keep his guard over you if you have discretion according to the good plan of the Lord. Now, discretion means a lot of things. It means knowing what not to say when you shouldn't be saying it. It means knowing what to say when you should speak up. It means knowing when to be out of sight, when you shouldn't be at a particular location, uh, maybe a meeting you weren't invited to, but you really wanted to be there, and so you kind of horned your way in. It also means, of course, being where you are expected. There's all of this and more is part of discretion. I would say this, is, this, this one is probably the one that as I travel around the world and meet Christians, this is the one I think that the church is the absolute weakest on. We lack discretion. So it, what it really implies is maturity, growing up and not allowing yourself to do certain things that you might desperately want to do, but you know this will be out of bounds. And with that, tabun, again, remember this word tabura, tabun, understanding, which unlocks the keys of power, will guard, it will create natsar within us. That's in 2.12. Well, there you go. That's the template that gives you Isaiah 11 in under 20 minutes. Now, where do we see this lived out? Well, here's an example. There was a man named Anselm of Canterbury. He wrote a book called Why Did God Have to Become a Man?, and in it, he articulates what today we know as the doctrine of penal substitutionary atonement. Jesus died in our place to take our sins. You can pull that out of the scripture, but believe it or not, before Anselm's time, they understood the atonement somewhat differently in the church. And so Anselm got that. But the thing that's interesting about Anselm is he was a, even though he was an archbishop, at a time when there was no Protestantism, so it was you know arch, it was it was Catholic or death, death, right? Uh, so he's an archbishop, and he's a man of a profound theologian. He's a man of the word, but he's a man of the spirit. And people came from all over Europe to get prophetic words from him, and to get healed by him, and to get their demons driven out. 
and um, so much was this the case that he writes in his private writings, his journals, how burdensome it was to try to get his day's work done when he had all these crowds of people coming to seek him out. So he's a living example of it from about a thousand years ago. Here's another one, John Wesley, the great revivalist. When Wesley would come to a town, he was a preacher of the word, but he wasn't so much a man of the spirit. He honored the spirit, but he didn't know how to flow in the spirit. And so when he would go into a town in his time in the 1700s, there were still many churches in England where they had what were termed anchorites. These were people who lived in a, in a little cubicle that was built onto the side of the church out of stone. And if you were an anchorite, they would enclose you and then they would wall it off and you couldn't get out unless they broke the wall down. And they'd put a little door in it and a little slot and every day they would slide food in provided you weren't on a fast and every day they would open the little door and the slop bucket would come out and they'd give you a new bucket so you could relieve yourself and usually all an anchorite had in there was a table maybe a candle a chair and a bed it was often very cold because it was England and it was stone and there was no heat but that's how the anchorites lived but most anchorites were prophets and so John Wesley knew that if he wanted to go to a town and he wanted to have a revival, he couldn't just show up and preach. So he would go and meet the anchorites. And oftentimes the anchorite would say, oh, Mr. Wesley, I knew you were coming three weeks ago. Yes, if you want to have the revival in this town, go down to Farmer Jones's field a mile out of town, set up under the big oak tree and preach there. That's where the Holy Spirit will fall. And so that became a catalyst for John Wesley's revivals that turned England on its head. So Wesley was a man who understood this dynamic. Well, in more modern times, we've got Paul Kane, we've got Bob Jones, we've got John Paul Jackson, we've got our own Chris Reed. We have examples of this, but these things are given to us that we would aspire to them. And of course, Chris's whole burden in starting the School of the Prophets is to reproduce this in many people. So I'm just giving you another layer, another tool to, to move you towards that. I've got some other examples in here, but I think I'll probably will skip them just because we're way over time. All right, so just a couple of other uh, comments and we're done. So a life marked by this kind of uh, infusion with the sevenfold spirit of God is incumbent upon us the book of James tells us that we should actually seek this out with great earnestness James chapter 1 if any of you lacks wisdom we could just swap out because the intent is the same if any of you lacks of the sevenfold spirit of God let him ask God who gives generously to all without reproach and it will be given him or her. Does that leave out anybody in this room? No. But let him or her ask in faith without doubting, for the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. That person must not suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. This is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Hmm. So if we want the sevenfold spirit of God, we should ask with confidence and boldness, and we shouldn't have that thing going on in our head, I'm not worthy, it's for somebody else. You know what it sounds like, because a lot of us have that self-talk going on all the time. Jesus is our pattern. Jesus is our pattern. I started out with that, 1 John 4.17. Jesus would have known both Isaiah 11, 1 to 5, both because it was in Isaiah, but because he would have understood from his family of origin that this was the word that was over his ultimate destiny. He would have also understood Proverbs 2, 1 to 15, and he would have seen that the one activates the other. And so it's unquestionable that he would have patterned his life after this, these passages. And so that leads us to a simple question, should we do any less? Becoming, becoming a people of the Spirit, becoming those who are led by the Spirit of God means that we practice the things that God prizes. And by the way, we don't only do this individually, we do it as a community. We literally enforce standards or uphold standards. That's probably a better word than enforce. Enforce is, has a kind of a pejorative tone to it today's ear. 
but we uphold standards that are consistent with all we've been articulating. And this means that the entire body politic, the whole community of faith can become that resting place for the Spirit of God. And even more than that, it attracts the presence of the Holy Spirit so that we become people of presence and power. It literally attracts the presence of the Spirit, as we saw with Jesus in the river, Luke 3.21. It generates a holiness in us, which is also wholeness. There is a direct link in, the, in Hebrew thinking between holiness and wholesome living. Of course, many times we get tangled up in things that are not wholesome, and with that we don't actually become all that God would have us to be. So pray aloud. That was one of the key takeaways in the outward actions. Cry aloud, meaning raise your voice and uh, shout if need be. And don't be afraid to let the tears flow. Cry, literally cry. Reverence God. That was one of the things Jesus was heard because of his reverence. Seek diligently and honor all that you know and all that you've just heard because there is no way to honor God by dishonoring God. And it's clear then that if we do these things that the gifts of the Spirit and specifically the sevenfold Spirit of God in all of his manifestations that go with each of those seven dimensions described in Isaiah, all of these things will come upon us and we will be, I'll say, overwhelmed or overpowered or subsumed or saturated. You could use different words to define this, but all of this will happen, and this is on the table. This is what the Lord wants for us. The keys for how to do it are hidden in plain view in the Scripture. Tonight we've unhidden them, and uh, you probably have enough now to meditate on and have devotions for at least a month. But with it, you should expect to see the level of manifestation in your own life rising. Amen? All right. I think we're done.